40 seconds. No, because uh, the recording starts exactly. Okay. Okay, so this is something experimental. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of a talk. It's not for your talk. Yeah, it's not for your talk. It's a thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, thing. Um, so, uh, my name is uh, Antoine Jacoteau. I've been an OpenBSD developer for uh, 11 years or so. And yeah, I think that's pretty much, uh, that pretty much sums it all. I'm Baptiste Daroussin. I'm a free BSD developer, member of the core team. And uh, I'm there in the project since uh, almost eight years now. And we're here to speak about things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, just a quick disclaimer be before we start. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different topics. Uh, but of course, first, we're not experts at everything. And second, uh, each topic that we're going to talk about could have their own one hour talk. So there are a lot of stuff we're not going to go deep into. So sorry about that. And uh, well, well, first, let's start with uh, how we came up with the idea of this talk. Um, because it was pretty funny, actually. It was like, I don't know, it was summertime, it was uh, yeah. the afternoon, we were having herbal tea, sponge cake, something like that. Oh. Yeah, exactly. We were having attractions, talking about something like the ponies, unicorns, oh, right, right, right. the first stars. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who came first, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that the was meeting, The usual meeting you can have. Yeah, exactly. We yeah. have uh, a lot of philosophical discussion with, uh, with Baptiste. And, yeah. Uh, so that, that was it. That was it. So quite a uh, summer afternoon. And... Well, no, you can tell them. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. We'll make it in. It was like 2 a.m. It was uh, in a pub somewhere. I don't remember where. We were having our 10th pint of, what was it, like crappy beer that, that I don't know, like Duvel or something? Or yeah, no, 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 no. You can't say that. We're in Belgium. Oh, all right, yeah. sorry, sorry. So, 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 <laughs> okay, so I was, what was it? Oh, it was crappy beer. It was Heineken. Uh, ah, Heineken, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we're having our 10 pints of uh, Heineken, and I was like, oh, but geez, this beer that doesn't have any flavor anymore. It's like, I can't feel the taste. Yeah. yeah. And that's when it hit me. My God, you guy, you suck. You don't have flavor packages. Uh, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, talking about flavor. Uh, flavor in packages on OpenBSD is actually a very interesting concept. Um, I'm not aware of any other Unix uh, package manager that actually implement it. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't, it's just that I don't know of any. Uh, what the flavored package uh, does is that it allows you uh, to provide packages compiled with a different set of options. So that's very convenient from a dependency point of view. Um, since according to the options that you want to compile the package with, um, the final binary will change. Uh, since it will end up linking to different libraries, etc. So to give you an example, um, let's say you want to compile SendMail uh, and uh, you want to give it support for SASL or LDAP and things like that. So of course, if you compile against LDAP, your package will link against LDAP. Maybe it's something you want, maybe it's something you don't want. And the thing is that on OpenBSD, we really want the user to use packages and not compile things. So Flavor lets you uh, basically <coughs> create a package with a pretty fun set of options. So we actually have several assignment packages that you can choose from when you install it, that they all conflict with each other, uh, of course. And that's actually pretty convenient from, a, from a, a dependency point of view. It's different from what a sub package is. Uh, sub package is when you build one big package that's too split. So that's typically used for things like, uh, like PHP, for example, uh, on OpenBSD, we build PHP with support for all modules. And at the end of the packaging, we actually split the package so you have PHP IMAP, PHP MySQL, PHP blah, 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 uh, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, on FreeBSD, it's true that we don't have the flavors. Uh, actually, we have kind of, I would say, a uh, shitty sub-package system where you just hack things so that you get actually a sub-package. 
Um, so for the case of PHP, it's basically the same as OpenBSD in the end, get PHP dash uh, IMAP, whatever. Uh, but it's true that some situation like for libeldap where you probably want to enable or disable SASLs depending on what you need. Uh, right now we have two packages, say both conflict together, but uh, imagine someone is uh, depending on LDAP and doesn't care if it's SASL or not. Uh, what we have defined as the default is the default. So if you install, I don't know, libeldap SASL and you some mail depend on libeldap, then it will remove some mail which is probably a good idea to remove some mail anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but we have work in progress in that direction. Uh, we are working a lot on that. The problem is um, we have a lot of old tools that deals with the port tree, uh, port master, port upgrade, and stuff like that. That depends on having a unique origin per package. And if you go to flavors, if you go to uh, sub packages, then you break that paradigm. So that's why it took so long to come, to come now. But we have decided that, okay, fuck those tools, let's make, let's make this happen and see if someone cares about those tools, they will have to fix it. And we will be happy to keep those tools if it's fixed. Okay, so like, let's say I need uh, SASL support in opening it up on FreeBSD. Yeah. So I assume it to be done myself, right? No, actually we have a package for it. Oh, okay. Uh, but then what happens if I, if I run like package update and package upgrade? It will remove everything that depends on your on your. Account. <laughs> so that's, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things we do support, uh, and I don't know what you do, is we do support upgrading packages on a given release. I mean binary. I got security issue, I got a new version, yeah, and I have the packages yeah, yeah. Have, in place. We actually do support uh, binary package upgrade on a given release, uh, but we do not provide the pre-compiled packages. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's true that uh, you need some kind of a build box uh, where you can uh, you can distribute your packages update from. Um, there's actually work in progress in this area, uh, and I'm pretty confident that within this year, uh, we'll be able to provide uh, binary upgrade for packages on all our supported releases. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so uh, keeping your box up to date will just be a matter of uh, package, package add minus u and, uh, and up here. Um, talking about distributing packages, <coughs> actually, uh, it's important to note that there are a lot of operation on OpenBSD uh, when using package add um, are all done in a, uh, using a non-privileged user. Uh, the fetching of the packages, extracting, verifying, verifying. Uh, the signature, etc., is all done as a separate user. Uh, we don't go online as a root uh, or nor as the build user. Um, we actually prevent uh, the build user to go online. Um, and if I remember correctly, um, you guys tried to do that in libfetch. Dropping yep. privilege, something like that, that was very good. Well, actually, yeah, what we do is since day one almost, well, since CAPC comes day one, the package is CAPC nice. So every single dangerous area are, are running in the sandbox. Uh, we also added uh, some privilege drop recently, actually, just before you did in a uh, few weeks before. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's three days exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I <checked. laughs> So before when BSD did, uh, I had to revert uh, the fetch sheet part uh, because um, it wasn't able to read, to read um, the net dot or the dot net or see something that people were using. Oh, so for the next release, I will add it again and add a mechanism so that I can fit this to this uh, net or C file. Uh, but anyway, we are sandbox almost everywhere, so we're safe even if we root. But okay. of course, it's better to have privilege separation. And most things in package now, if they don't need root requirements, switch into a non-privileged user. Okay. Um, well, I guess we're pretty much done with the, uh, the package side. Um, yeah, uh, well, no, I just wanted to add that uh, there, there is a big difference uh, in the way we see things in uh, OpenBSD and FreeBSD when we regard to packaging, is that since day one, our primary goal was always to provide binary packages. So it is a little bit um, shameful that we're not actually providing uh, upgrade for these packages on, on a given release. Uh, as I said, this, this is gonna change. Uh, but it's really a different 
different vision that uh, that we have compared to you, where uh, you actually do build a lot of stuff, or at least historically you used to to build a lot of stuff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm a bit late. <laughs> um, yeah, we used to build a lot of stuff. Well, the I'm lost. <laughs> uh, <No>. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but one thing about the boss tree um, is that it, it works on every single supported version of FreeBSD because we have kind of long term support uh, in FreeBSD. And so it's hard to, to make large modification that may break old version. But yeah, that's something you don't really know. As you do support only something for six months. Well, <laughs> you're, you're correct that for packages, we only support the current release, uh, which uh, today is uh, 6.0. Uh, the OS itself is supported for two releases. Um, and aside from current uh, snapshots, our port tree is actually tagged to a specific release. So we, we don't follow a rolling uh, release model on the port street. Um, and we don't want our user to be forced to upgrade to a new major release of the software on a given release. So if you have a, if you have a major update of some port in your tree, uh, you maybe you don't want to have to, to be forced and update it uh, until you actually upgrade your uh, operating system as well. So it's, it's against a different, a different way of, uh, of uh, seeing, how, uh, seeing the packaging, I guess. Um, also, considering the fact that we do have uh, regular six-month uh, releases, uh, our packages don't have really time to, uh, to get very old anymore. So that, that's, I, don't, I don't, don't really see it as a problem, personally. Um, but that said, as I mentioned, there's an uh, ongoing discussion about uh, supporting uh, previous releases, not just the, the current one. And yeah, that's it. Um, when I say support, uh, what I mean is that we actually provide uh, a CVF patch or div, and for the package, we're not providing the binary packages, but for base, we're only providing a div as well. We're not providing uh, any <coughs> binary update or whatever. Uh, this is actually going to change. Um, there is a little work in progress tool called syspatch um, that <coughs> will allow you to patch uh, a given release of uh, OpenBSD without the need to recompile anything. Uh, which will be, which I guess will make a huge difference uh, in the way people uh, put the open, open BSD in production. Um, other than that, yeah, I do uh, understand the need for for LTS release. Uh, I do, uh, but I just don't want to be the one who actually administer those kind of releases. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about support, uh, I see that you guys have like some long-term support, extended support, normal support. I mean, what the fuck is your policy? So how, how come FreeBSD 10.1 was still supported and 10.2 wasn't? Come on, that's easy. No. no. <laughs> In our model, what do we have? We have the normal releases. So a normal release is, is a release you take out of the stable branch, you say, okay, this is FreeBSD 10.0, <coughs> and then you support that for uh, a minimum of 12 months, 12 months, and so to quote, to quote the, um, the policy on the website, and for sufficient additional time, if needed, to ensure that the newer release, uh, that there is a newer release at least three months before the older normal release expires. So that's the normal one, easy. Yeah. And then you got the extended. <laughs> And so the extended is basically you select a release, usually the second release each time, and uh, you keep it for 24 more months, and that's it. And also the latest release of a given branch is extended support, so you have it. You have 24 more months on the latest one. So that's easy. It is? No, it not. <laughs> 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 really not. <laughs> that's the reason why on FreeBSD 11 we have decided to change that to a model that. Everyone will understand. Oh, okay, so cool. basically, right now, uh, a given branch, like say FreeBSD 11, will be supported for uh, five years, and we can make release whenever we want out of that branch. As soon as the release is there, people will have uh, I don't remember something like three, two months, three. three months. They have three months to upgrade to the new release. And given we provide stable ABI, they are just uh, let's say a newer revision of the same release. 
and then people can exactly know where they are and how long it's supported. And you won't have any more 11.1 uh, uh, supported uh, while 11.2 is not supported anymore. And you can understand what you're doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it looks like the uh, FreeBSD support model uh, keeps newer feature out of the hands of the user. Uh, if I understand a bit what uh, what you mentioned about uh, about how releases are stored, um, so in my opinion, I mean, our model is makes a bit more sense, uh, and it keeps the code stable but still pretty fresh. Uh, we have a new release every six months. Whatever is in current will be in the next release in a few weeks, or in worst case, in five six months. Um, how, how does it work? Yeah. You know? Well, I think you misunderstood the way we are developing. Like uh, the previous 11 branches uh, will not only receive bug fixes, but also new features as, on, as long as it don't break the ABI and compatibility. Let's say we have uh, a new Clang version and we need a new Clang version for anything, for a new compiler. <coughs> then we can just uh, merge the, the compiler and 11.2 will be released with a new compiler. So all the new feature will end up any, anyway in the releases that the user have. So that's not that different. It's just that we do guarantee that we don't break the ABI. So if you build a binary on FreeBSD 11.0, then on 11.3, it will run out of box. OK. Well, you did say that you had to wait for at the very least two years before being able to use more than two available. Before, in the port three. Ah. Uh, why? Because um, with the previous model, we had to support uh, a release, and we don't release a new version because if you release a new version, let's say we release 10.4, then the support gets extended for two years, and then we can't bring new tools. So because the POS3 <laughs> works on 11 and 10, then I need to get the compiler I got in my 10.4 working for the POS3 anyway, or the feature that I added, which are in previous 11 and not yet in, in 10, uh, I would have to wait two, two years in the post three to be able to use them, which is not the case anymore because with the new model, what I do is just merge that to 10, release a new version of 10, and then in that case, I don't extend the support, but still the user benefits from the new tool and the post three can just straight away use it. So we fix that with the new, with the new uh, release model. Okay. Anyone got it? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a bit confused, but okay, trust you. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about binary updates. <coughs> yeah, let's look at that binary updates. <laughs> okay, um, given this support binary upgrade, uh, it's very easy to upgrade from a minor version to a new minor version. Let's say I release uh, FreeBSD 11.1, I just do FreeBSD update, uh, FreeBSD, uh, sorry, FreeBSD upgrade, and I'm going to the new version uh, in place, and that's very nice. But uh, I'm also able to go from a uh, um, major release to another major release and do a, a nice upgrade. Uh, so it's very simple. Uh, it helps us to do a lot of things. And seriously, how tedious it should be to, for me to update OpenBSD boxes where you're breaking uh, ABI, uh, you can't upgrade in place. And wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I see what you're going um, Actually, it's not, it's not entirely true. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, binary upgrades between releases are perfectly supported, um, obviously. Uh, what is not supported, indeed, are in-place upgrades um, of the base system, at least. Um, well, I don't see it as an issue. Uh, usually, supporting in-place upgrade are, uh, is nice when the actual upgrade process takes a long time, so that you not, don't want to, to have a, your machine like a uh, uh, offline for like 30 minutes. Um, but when you have uh, machines in production, uh, you have redundancy anyway, right? So I, I don't see it uh, as, a, as a big, a big issue. Um, also, the upgrade process of OpenBSD itself is uh, one of the easiest and fa fastest uh, that I've worked with. Um, that's actually an objective review. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is, it is. I mean, just reboot on the uh, BSD RD uh, run this kernel. Um, and it will do the rest for you in like uh, three minutes, seriously. Uh, and with support for auto install and auto upgrade uh, in OpenBSD, you really have absolutely nothing to do. It's completely uh, automatic. I mean, you can, you can upgrade like uh, thousands of bucks and, uh, by just rebooting uh, on the proper kernel. Uh, everything will be automatically upgraded, packages included. Uh, and 
uh, when you first boot after the upgrade, uh, we have Sysmerge, which is uh, uh, like a merge master uh, tool in FreeBSD. Uh, it's run automatically very early in the, during the boot process, so even your configuration file uh, will will have a good chance to be automatically updated. As well. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that the thing is that. If you, if you tweak your configuration file a lot, then obviously uh, it will require manual <coughs> intervention. It will not try to, uh, to force uh, a greater file. Yeah, it's a merge, I, I think, so it's complicated anyway. Yeah, it's complicated. But it will send you a mail telling you that this and this and this file uh, needs Well, if it boots. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there, is no, there is no configuration file that will prevent you from booting. Yeah, OK. Because it's, the, it's tool is run, the tool is run after. Yeah. So yeah, don't try and trick me here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not that bad. So you're able to go from a release to a release, seems that it's pretty okay. But uh, what you do to update in your, I mean, uh, you got security issues and let's oh, say, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got security issues and you need to get uh, a diff on your system, it's running, what, are, what do I have to do? Seriously, I take well, the patch, I apply it to CVS and I bill? Yes. On well, a, on welcome to the 80s. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mentioned it a bit earlier as well. Uh, uh, it's true that the dates within a particular release uh, are not supported. I mean, they are supported uh, using a CVS patch. Um, so you have to build yeah. a new release yourself. Or, um, I mentioned syspatch earlier. Hopefully, uh, this will, it will be enabled for our next release, 6.1, in, in a couple of months. Uh, it will be a technological preview, uh, meaning that the, the tool will be there, hopefully. Um, the way it work uh, may change uh, for 6.2 or 6.3. Uh, we'll try and learn uh, how people use it and, uh, and the, the, uh, the usage uh, that they, they, they're doing with the tool. So what we did is that we tried to create something really stupid and simple, uh, something that will just fetch uh, pre-compiled tarball, same kind of tarball that uh, we, we, we for the, the, uh, the base system set. Um, so fetching, verifying uh, with signify, extracting, and then installing uh, the uh, new batteries, <coughs> libraries, etc. Uh, while creating a rollback uh, tarball in case something bad happened or if you need to roll back the uh, patch for whatever reason. So we're, we're trying to, to have a very, very, very simple tool. <coughs> and uh, hopefully people will like it and it will become permanent. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, on FreeBSD, uh, we do support right now already binary upgrade uh, in place, which are very nice. I mean, you get security issues, you do FreeBSD update fetch, February the update install, and then uh, everything has been uh, replaced, modified. Um, so the way the tool works is um, basically it, it works based on binary diffs. So the security officer will just uh, rebuild the system, uh, make a binary diff of the binaries that has changed between the two builds, and then you fetch it and you, you install it. It works very nicely. Uh, it's very convenient for security fixes. Uh, it's very simple for the user. It's safe. Uh, FreeBSD update does a bit more things, like uh, I, tell, I said earlier, uh, upgrading from a release to a release. So the way it goes is, well, the same way you do fetch. You fetch all your new binaries, well, actually patches between the old release and the new release. And then uh, it's installed the new, well, patch your kernel and prepare the, the kernel. You reboot on the new kernel. You're on the old user learn, but the new kernel. Then you install the new user learn. So that's to prevent um, having new user learn that might have syscall that doesn't exist yet in your old kernel. And then it merged all the configuration file, and hopefully everything works. Uh, this is nice. <laughs> it, wor it works fairly well. The problem is uh, it can be for very long. Well, I mean, by very long is. Uh, try to fetch something like uh, 100,000 of binary patches uh, <laughs> until they get it. And then try to wait for your shell script to figure out uh, which one it should patch, how it verifies, will verifies checksum signatures, blah, blah, blah. So it can take a very long time to be able to upgrade from a, uh, from a release to another one. So we are now trying to um, experiment with uh, replacing that <coughs> package itself. So if we package the base system, uh, so it will remain the base system, but split into multiple <coughs> packages, okay. then uh, it depends. I don't know yet, uh, to be honest, but a lot. And uh, 
And then when you get security update, you get a new version of your package, and then your package upgrade, it's installed like every single thing we have in the port tree on the package is already. And that's what, that might be uh, way faster than what we have right now. One of the issue, to be honest, with uh, there is some, sorry, some drawback with in-place upgrades, is we depend on some technologies that we don't develop initially ourselves, and or we depend on another upstream where which we work with, like ZFS. <coughs> and um, the, that upstream decide well uh, for them uh, the upgrades are a bit like on OpenBSD. Like you get a release and upgrade is try to go to the new release, and so the kernel and the user learn has to be. Um, uh, the same and uh, in sync. Why don't previous data at the moment you are on a new kernel and you still have the old the old user or tool? And if let's say uh, the some 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 uh, function from that FS has changed, then your user tool won't work with that. And we had a couple of time to uh, re-implement the backward compatibility into ZFS to make sure that we can support our uh, ZFS upgrade. So it's extra work sometimes. But I think it's it's worth the price. Okay. Well do try to be very, very clever here. <laughs> We're way much simpler than that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, well, uh, in place of great, yeah, okay, that's nice. But you still need to reboot. I mean, if you had in place of great that you, and you don't need to reboot, then yeah, okay, you'll have my vote. But other than that, I don't really see the point. Uh, yeah, well, anyway. Uh, another interesting thing we have in the, in the FreeBSD model is um, what we call Polar. It's principle of least astonishment. So basically, it means that don't try to fuck up the user system. <laughs> <laughs> so if something was working, you upgrade to something new, make sure that you don't break everything on the system and that your upgrade goes out of box. Yeah, in general, we're not afraid of breaking backward compatibility uh, when we think it makes sense and can help us push ideas forward. Um, but that's it. I can understand the need for Polar, uh, obviously. Uh, Except when it goes against ba basic security. Uh, like, for example, uh, reading your upgrading file somewhere in the source, source tree, I think SSH or something. Uh, I see that just to satisfy third party clients, uh, you guys kept DSA encryption, AES, CDC, uh, SSH1 support. Uh, like, month and month after upstream, uh, actually removed it. Yeah, because on the release, we didn't want the guy to be able to upgrade and having their key not working. But on the next major release, we remove that. So yeah, given our model, it's months later, for sure. But uh, that's not exactly also what Polar should, does not really prevent every such thing. We could have uh, removed that if we wanted. Um, that's the drawback of Polar. People, if they don't <coughs> like to do something, they, they scream at Polar and say, hey, don't touch my system. While Polar says, we should not fuck up the system of the user, but sometimes we need to, and so we need to tell them how they, ca they will have to upgrade and have warning long enough in advance and things like that. So, yeah, we have to be very careful about Polar. Uh, it's <coughs> a very nice principle. It's just not an excuse to not <coughs> do anything. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, speaking of, uh, of a great uh, delivery, um, it would be interesting to know how you guys build and ship packages. Um, on OpenBSD, we use a tool. It's called the DPB, uh, the Distributed Package Builder. Uh, it's a Perl daemon that orchestrates a multi-node setup for building the, uh, the entire port tree or a handful of set of packages. Um, it allows us to uh, to build like the, the entire set of, uh, of uh, packages in less than 24 hours, which is uh, which is convenient. So we can have a new set uh, every day. Um, as most of our daemon, it comes with privilege separation. Uh, it runs at a different build user, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it uses uh, a short sandbox to build packages. Uh, the actual goal for that would be that each package built will have its own sandbox. Um, so there's work in progress for that. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, the only process that goes online is the uh, fetching BTS file. Well, on FreeBSD, historically, we were using a tool which, ha which had a design, besides being a total crap, had a design which was pretty close to DPB. It was called Tinderbox. And uh, yeah, it worked quite, quite okay back in the time. But we changed that to a new tool, uh, which actually I wrote, 
Uh, Stop showing off. Yeah. <laughs> It's crap as well, it's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically what it does, instead of distributing the bill, which can bring a lot of complexity uh, to the always, uh, um, do I still <coughs> communicate with that box, blah, blah, blah. We decided to build everything in one single box, uh, distributing one bill per core. So we ended up with something like if you have a 24 core box, you have 24 packages that are built at the same time. And doing that, by surprise, we discovered <coughs> that we got faster uh, builds. Uh, we ended up with uh, something like a single day to build uh, the, the, the entire port 3 back in the time when it was only 24,000 packages. Now <coughs> it's um, way more and now Chrome exists. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so aside from that, uh, what we have is the packages are signed uh, on a box without internet access. Uh, the main difference with the way uh, you are doing is uh, probably because we don't sign per package. Uh, we sign the entire repository, which has uh, hashes of what package is. So we have only one signature to check instead of checking per package. Yeah, that's a difference. Uh, we, we don't want to rely on the repository metadata uh, for anything. So indeed, we do sign each and every package, which make them also easier to share. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so since we switched to Poudrier, uh, we're unable, now able to provide updates and binary uh, packages almost every day. Well, before it was whenever that cluster was happy to build things and uh, to, being, to, to build things properly. Um, so while working on that, uh, we're, that new tool to, build, to have a lot of, uh, well, to, to have faster builds, whatever, we use every single uh, functionality that we have on FreeBSD. Like, uh, we use gels to separate the builds to make sure that they don't have access to the network when we need to when they don't need uh, access to the <coughs> network. We can use a ZFS to populate to have a fast population of the various <coughs> gels. So it's built in a single jail on a single core. Uh, we use TMPFS if we want fast IO, and of course uh, we we do use um, SMB because yeah we can run on more than twenty four cores. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, speaking of multiple cores, are you guys still having the giant log somewhere? Well, well everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Um, okay, there's working pro uh, progress, obviously. Uh, but honestly, for regular desktop usage or big log SMP implementation model, so the kernel log, uh, is, is good enough. Um, the reason is that most time on the workstation, you only, only have a handful of, uh, amount of cores. Uh, <coughs> between two and eight, uh, and only one socket. And our actual scheduler isn't, isn't bad either. It's just uh, that it's a bit old. Uh, it was written for real SMP machines, meaning that it does not consider the, uh, the cache distance between the cores. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons why the uh, machine with uh, several sockets uh, often have lower performance uh, than the one with only one socket. Uh, we do, uh, we, it's true that we do a lot of ping pong. So we can use 24 cores, <laughs> uh, but in the context of bug build, it's way, way better uh, for us in terms of performance to actually split these 24 cores into six different machines. But uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully uh, <laughs> performance will, uh, will improve. Yeah, well, I wonder how you will handle this kind of change in the model of uh, OpenBSD. Uh, because, I mean, uh, when FreeBSD took that road and changed the model to go to something more SMP, uh, it took a lot of time. Uh, it also ended up with some fabulous release like FreeBSD 5.0. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm not saying that the road we took, well, we have to change almost everything in <coughs> one big release uh, is the only one to go. But I don't see how you can do with a very uh, incremental, simple way uh, getting rid of this giant lock. Okay, well, there's a few things that can uh, be incremental uh, because they're not, they're not completely related to the schedule itself. Um, like, for example, some, some performance issue that we have on OpenBSD actually come from uh, spin lock in our uh, P-thread implementation. Uh, so that's being actively worked on. Uh, we do expect a huge improvement in that regard for the next release or the one after. Um, and contrary to the myth, I mean, we scale very nicely on the big user land uh, workloads. Uh, of course, is our raw performance on par with FreeBSDs? No, but we have different priorities. Um, and we're okay if we lose a bit of performance 
uh, if that gains us more security or more simplicity or something that's closer to the goal that we have. Yeah, so to tell the truth, anyway, SMP support is something that should be done uh, all the time because things change each year from one socket to multiple socket to multiple cores and whatever. And on freebies is an exchange is really to get something like uh, better NUMA aware uh, support in the kernel. Um, we need also to uh, improve a lot of uh, me uh, locking mechanism to get into, if we can, direction of uh, lockless things. So we are experimenting right now with uh, uh, concurrency <coughs> to the kernel. Uh, what is the current status uh, right now of your moving to a fast uh, SMP and OpenGSD? Well, uh, our entire SCSI stack and kernel providing are already fully SMP, for example. Uh, recently, there's been some huge uh, work uh, and progress on making our network uh, stack SMP friendly. Um, the goal being to uh, be able to, uh, to, to forward traffic over multiple threads and things like that. Um, I don't think you will argue uh, the fact that modern scheduling is hard, <laughs> as you mentioned it. Uh, most operating system actually had to do it several times. I mean, yeah. some even rolled back, and I mean, when you see what happened in Linux land, for example, it's scheduling, uh, right? I mean, they have like 10 different scheduler, and so, yeah, that, that scaling is hard. Um, so, as usual, on OpenBSD, we lag a bit behind uh, in that regard, but we're also learning from uh, uh, the other uh, operating system mistakes. So, hopefully, we'll come there uh, uh, slowly, but... Uh, uh, and hopefully with a simple uh, implementation because that's how we like things. When, as I said earlier, you guys are way too clever. We're just too good. <laughs> right, so what do you hear? Can you explain me something I never understand on, on, on OpenBSD and the way you handle the project? Uh, it seems like you keep <coughs> rewriting all the tools even if there is already BSD licensed counterparts. I mean, HTTPD, SN, SNTPD, uh, VMM, well, you're not suffering some kind of NIH syndrome? <laughs> That's actually a very good question. Um, I'm glad that you ask it, uh, because uh, in my opinion, there are very objective reasons uh, to do that. Um, the first one would be trust and control. Uh, we have a coding style, practice, and process uh, that makes us confident in what we develop. Um, we know uh, someone will not decide to change the software license, for example, one day to the next, or st start adding options and knobs uh, for each and every crazy, crazy corner case uh, that, that no one will be using. Um, and looking at how many CVEs uh, impacted, like uh, uh, NTPD uh, or OpenSSL uh, in the last couple of years, should be a good hint as to why it was necessary to actually create uh, uh, NTPD implementation for us, or fork uh, and become Libre SSL. Um, so I, I don't think it's really an NIH syndrome to uh, want to write secure, secure implementation, even if a BSD counterpart does exist. Right, uh, but let's. There's no BSD, no. BSD quality good enough, well, but not good enough uh, in BSD alternatives. But what about Beehive? I mean, it was working because of the design. It's very easy to um, to add security requirements that you may want. And so, why started a new implementation? Well, the, the well because we had to basically uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, an effort was started to actually import Beehive. Uh, but after just a week uh, trying to do that uh, and not even being able to compile like two C files, uh, we decided that, I mean, <coughs> if it's that much work to be to port this software, then we just should write our own uh, from scratch. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was, uh, it was, I mean, the, the situation may have changed uh, since now Behave has been ported to Mac OS, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so maybe, maybe it evolved, but at the time, uh, it was, uh, it was really complicated. And but there was an effort that started. So it's not, it's not that we said, okay, let's create VMM and not look into BI. We actually did look into BI. So, um, mm -hmm. but on and on, I guess, I guess having control and and rewriting some part of the uh, software ecosystem. Um, gives us a base system that in our definition just works and works the way we want it to work. 
Um, like if you ever feel the need to tune or harden something on OpenBSD or tweak on bil billions of options, then you're clearly on the uh, wrong uh, operating system. And that's why also we are rewriting still things to be really simple. Right, right. But I mean, um, what about the case of sandboxing? We have Capsicum. It works. Was, it was there way before uh, OpenBSD. So why not? There's also a very good reason for that. Um, but before we talk about uh, Capsicum and our uh, sandboxing implementation, since you brought up the subject of security, we can we can talk about it a bit. Okay, let's go on it. So I, I maybe start with something which is not directly related to security, but helps a lot uh, when you develop to get secure application, well, to not get flows. So let's take a, let's talk a bit about our malloc implementation, which is a GE malloc. Um, yeah, so that tool is very nice. Uh, well, that malloc is very nice because it helps us to, you have a lot of tuning you can do on it through malloc.conf or the malloc.conf variable, where you can, uh, for example, um, use a tool called Profleek, Profleek, which allows you through malloc to detect memory leaks, a bit like gbirth tools do, are, are doing that. Uh, we can do heap profiling. Uh, we can do a lot of things like that. We can also put some uh, garbage in the memory when you malloc so that to make sure that you don't corrupt things. Yeah, I think we're pretty similar in that regard. Uh, our memory allocator has a lot of countermeasures as well. Uh, some are not enabled by default because they're very costly in terms of performance. Uh, but we, uh, developer, do run with them uh, because it allows us to uh, catch a lot of uh, different issues beforehand. So uh, they're, they're pretty. Uh, we have a lot of very convenient option in our in our malloc. Uh, the capital C option uh, is, is, uh, is a good example. It enables all the uh, security related uh, uh, options in malloc um, for security auditing. Uh, we have quart pages uh, that can be enabled, so just to provide you with uh, overrun detection. Um, a whole bunch of different uh, different countermeasures like that. Yeah, so like both malloc are quite in the same chain regarding debugging and memory related potential security issues, but in a different way, right. almost the same. Um, on a side topic, uh, related but uh, uh, different from malloc, um, the way we develop uh, our, our uh, demons on OpenBSD are uh, always pretty much the same. Um, we do privilege separation. Uh, most of the code is run shrouded as, uh, as a non-privileged user. And OpenSSH kind of led the way uh, uh, for the way we're doing things now. Uh, it was the first to actually implement all of this uh, uh, before uh, anything else in OpenBSD. So we use also privilege revocation, uh, uh, privilege, uh, to drop privilege as soon as possible. Um, I mentioned NTPD earlier, which is a good example. Um, it's a really traditional, so if you look at the code, it's a, it's a good example because it's a traditional uh, open BSD written daemon. Um, it was written with principle of least pri uh, the least privilege in mind. Uh, so not only does it <coughs> set and quick drop, but it also has complete uh, privilege separation TLS speaker for the constraint feature. Um, the constraint feature is actually a, a, a pretty cool one. It uh, allows you to mitigate the, uh, the uh, man in the middle attack. Uh, basically, you will, well, when, you, when you ask the tag from a remote uh, time server, you will also connect in, uh, using HTTPS to a well-known website, Google, Apple, whatever. And, and get the time uh, from the web server as well. So you can actually compare compare what the time server and one well -known, what a well-known uh, web server on the internet uh, gives you. And if the, the, the constraint is too large, then you prob there is probably uh, a, a problem somewhere. Yeah, the thing is, uh, you did that, but I have a lot of problems <coughs> in the case of NTP. Like, for example, you don't support half of the features that are supposed to be supported, like authenticating the peers like, which are giving you as a time, or supporting proper leaps uh, in, in that case. Yeah, but you, you actually just described exactly uh, the strength of open FTPD. It is simple. It does, not, it does not need to authenticate because we use constraints. That's good enough. Uh, it doesn't need to implement the kitchen sink because no one cares and no one uses most NTPD feature. Um, and if there is a, a need for it, then we have the NTPD package that people can, uh, can uh, install and use instead. It's just by default we want something simple and, uh, and secure. Um, and on a really uh, related topic, um, we are well known for our numerous exploit mitigation techniques. Um, 
It's important to note that all of these have been enabled by default for years, um, and they're very hard to actually disable. Uh, we don't want to encourage people to activate them. We actually activate them by default and make it very hard uh, to disable them. Um, I won't go into, uh, into a lot of details, but uh, we have uh, ASLR uh, or no patch people here can say ASLR. <laughs> <laughs> um, WXRX, uh, the uh, stack machine protection from uh, uh, police. Uh, Pi executable uh, for, for static binaries as well. Um, the way we approach uh, the, the OS development is that we assume that we're running in a hostile environment. Uh, so everything we do is actually uh, actually done on that. Yeah, so in FreeBSD, uh, well, yeah, we don't have yet uh, SLR, but we have probably also we have a couple of mitigation technique way less, so I agree. Uh, but we also have something like the Mac framework, which is mandatory access control, which is very nice to be able to uh, compartmentize what an application is supposed to access to as a resource network, file systems, uh, or to view on a system, preventing uh, seeing that there are other users or the process, and way more. Um, we also have a very nice uh, op um, auditing uh, <coughs> framework uh, through OpenDSM, which allows you to um, Let's report everything that happened on your system and even report that on a remote machine if you need to through a distributed mechanism. Okay. Well, just uh, to rebound on, the, on what you said earlier regarding uh, Capsicum. Um, so we do have a, a sandbox uh, implementation. It's called Pledge. Um, so now the reason why we did not port Capsicum is that Capsicum is too complicated. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad. It's a very, it's a very good capability system. Uh, it's just too complex. Um, and as such, we think it doesn't get as much use as it should be. Um, the pledge Cisco is actually a, a, a very simple uh, and describe exactly what we, how we, we envision security. We want to provide affordable security. Uh, by affordable, I mean simple, easy to use, uh, and make it easy for the actual developer programmer to add pledge call uh, into his code. Um, when Pledge was implemented, 30% uh, of our base system was Pledge after only about two months. And today, we have between 85 and 90% of uh, uh, the entire user land in base uh, that use Pledge. And even some big ports like Chromium is Pledge. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually pretty easy to use, uh, so, and as such, people actually use them. Um, it also has a nice uh, side effect is that it, it I guess that that's also true with Capsicum, but uh, it encourages um, actually re-auditing your code yeah. to know exactly <coughs> where you're going to put the pledge call and something like that. So, so yeah. Uh. Another feature we have on FreeBSD that you don't have is uh, the JS, uh, which are uh, container secure by design, by default, and which allows you to, to, to run the process in a prison that cannot do anything uh, if you want to. Like reducing, you can just limiting the number of CPU, you can limiting the memory, the resource, the access to the network or no, and things like that. That is very powerful to be able to uh, add security on the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that regard, I do agree that we suck. Uh, we have no container-like technology. Uh, there's been an initial e effort a few years ago uh, called SysJail, but uh, it, was, uh, it was using SysTrace, which uh, had a big security flow uh, would, that rendered basically the, uh, the, uh, the sandbox completely, uh, completely new. So, <coughs> but uh, anyway, uh, let's... Uh, well, I think given the time, we'll probably skip the project uh, yeah, yeah, explanation yeah. on how the different project works. And that's the round two, which will last for me. Two minutes, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a two track talk. Yeah, it's supposed to be a two track talk, but. <coughs> right, so let's speak about the BSD education. <coughs> I mean, you claim a lot about your license purity, everything should be BSD, and we do uh, almost the same, but I'm very surprised uh, by the fact that uh, there's a lot of product we're working on to bring BSD license tools in the base system, <laughs> and we don't see you in that area, in particular when you speak about uh, the tool chain, for example. We are very close to get the first release without GPL in in, in base and FreeBSD. Well, okay. For tier uh, one. For what? For tier one. 
What is that? <laughs> so tier one uh, and FreeBSD means uh, the, the main supported <coughs> release, not in terms of supporting the code. So basically right now it's AMD64 and i386. Uh, but it, it means that uh, the one we are providing binary security patches, uh, oh, okay. well, security, binary security patches, <laughs> because security patches will provide for everything. And uh, so that's the most common one. We yeah. don't provide for MIPS, for example. <coughs> okay. Well, see, well, we support the platform or we don't support it. Uh, so there is no tier one, two, three uh, on OpenDSV. <laughs> Yeah, so basically on FreeBSD, the status right now is um, on tier one. We, re we removed uh, uh, GCC, Leaf Standard C++, with a, we have a full, almost full um, compiler chain uh, BSD license. Uh, we also removed half of the BNU tier <coughs> using our uh, home-backed uh, Elflow chain project, which removes every single <coughs> the linker. We are pretty close to add LLD right now, which will be the next linker uh, to replace BNU tiers totally. And so the only left things uh, are, oh, we removed uh, tech info because who cares? <laughs> who, who reads tech info files? I mean, no one. We remove CVS, obviously, because we're not on CVS anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we remove our CVS. And uh, GDB is slowly being removed, uh, replaced by LLDB. So what is left is we still have GNU diff. Uh, well, as diff has been replaced by an open BSD and a BSD mix plus some free BSD patches on top of it. You might want the patches, by the way. <laughs> um, Send them over. Yeah, I need to. <laughs> uh, Graph is still there because a couple of man page are not rendering and because we have a lot of papers that were written back in the old time by free BSD developers that are in the base system that are ah. written in rough. So we are still looking at what we do with that. Uh, GNU grep is still there because there is too many bugs in BSD grep for now, but I mean for FreeBSD 12, I'm pretty sure that will be uh, fully without any uh, GPL license stuff. What is the situation for you? Well, okay, I will not talk about the licenses uh, itself because uh, I'm not a religious guy. Um, <coughs> besides a few exceptions, most of the uh, user land uh, is BSD license on OpenBSD. Uh, with Obviously, you still have some kind of a fork of GNU CVS uh, that we cannot remove right now. Uh, RCS is actually a rewrite, uh, BSD rewrite uh, uh, implementation. Uh, so that's under a BSD license. Uh, Mandoc takes care of all our man needs, so we actually don't need uh, um, a rough, uh, rough uh, in the base system at all. So it's that's gone since a while. Um, regarding the tool shell, uh, tool chain, sorry. Uh, you guys are thinking your head, uh, I agree. Uh, but we finally <coughs> did jump on the bandwagon, uh, thanks to the ARM64 architecture. So now we do have LLVM, CLang, uh, and all the gang uh, uh, in base. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail because uh, this effort is somewhat, uh, somewhat recent. Uh, so there's probably a lot of things that are going <coughs> to change in the, in the upcoming month. Um, but we're doing pretty much. We're going pretty much into the same directions as uh, you guys are LLD, uh, LLD C++, etc., etc. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we have no tier one, two, three. So we still have to support some architecture that will most probably never be supported by uh, LLVM uh, and, uh, and the gang. So we'll have to keep uh, um, GCC and such uh, in place. Um, yep. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that it took that long because you wanted to skip one <coughs> of the subjects, which is this one. <laughs> we don't want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we will have to. I just <laughs> okay, think we'll have to. Well, we'll be very quick. So basically, we have a lot of file system support, including very modern one. Uh, we have journalization, soft updates, things like that. We have very nice SCSI, uh, SCSI support, very uh, low-level system for storage, uh, multi-pass, encryption, whatever. What is the situation on OpenBSD? <laughs> I don't think people are really interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, well, I will summarize it by saying that we still have bugs in soft updates. Yeah. You so, still have bugs in soft updates, seriously? Yeah. But I mean, you guys have curve, so yeah, true. It's easy, to do. <laughs> but yeah, no, we we uh, we don't have the, we don't have ZFS, obviously. Uh, I guess licensing, uh, but not just that. Um, I use ZFS daily uh, on different operating systems. 
low nose of your ear. It's really great. It's just super scary. Uh, what what scares me the most is that it requires ECC memory. And when the file system requires ECC memory, it doesn't really. You can leave well, it. Well, it's highly recommended. Of course, it works yeah. without it, but. Uh, so that's kind of scary. It's big. It's not just a file system. It's actually an entire volume maintenance, whatever. Uh, but it's, it's a, I mean, feature-wise, it's great. It's awesome. And there's no... Too bad we don't have time to compare our desktop situation. <laughs> well, we're actually pretty much the same on the desktop, I guess. Yeah, we sucked, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's but not entirely true. it's getting there. It's not entirely true. We have all the packages, everything. But I mean, the drivers are, we are still lagging behind. And we've wired yeah, the wireless driver. Wi-Fi and, and X. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, so, so um, also thing consider, uh, it's pretty <coughs> obvious that my BSD is sucks less than yours. Oh, I'm not really sure. Uh, I pretty found that mine sucks very well less than yours. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, OpenBSD, even if it sucks more than FreeBSD, uh, is around as they push a lot of BSD license tool uh, and they are very pushing also security um, security coding principle and widespreading that. So that's, I'm very happy that you were there, guys. Thank you. Well, I think uh, FreeBSD is very important as well. Uh, first of all, it's a real uh, enterprise operating system. Uh, and it's, for me, the way I see it, it's slowly filling up the, uh, the spot left by uh, Solaris. It uh, bundled some amazing piece of, of, uh, of technology. Uh, and what is great about it is that it's actually our um, emblem uh, uh, to, to the, uh, the, uh, the external ecosystem. That is, that is people know about FreeBSD, a uh, huge company <laughs> with FreeBSD, uh, like, I mean, Netflix and all. So it's not just like, like some weird, uh, weird fringe operating system, so. Thank you. So we both organized the next EuroBSDCon in Paris in September. So we hope to see you, everyone there. Save the dates. And you can have the long version of the talk. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, we know now that we could fit two hours. <laughs> it would be in English. Well, in Franklish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me. Have you ever played